Harold Pinter, um, you've not been short of awards uh, during your career, but what did it mean to you to win the Nobel Prize? The first, my reaction was a great, great surprise. And um, I was rather... I couldn't take it in, really. But when I started to think about it, and I was asked to make a speech in Stockholm, which I couldn't do because I was in hospital, so I made a speech, I did write a speech, and I made it on um, Channel 4. Um, I took the opportunity, realizing that I was on a world platform, to say precisely what I thought about um, things. You called it um, art, truth and politics. I mean, do you feel that as a writer you have a responsibility, no matter how oblique, the political references are in your plays to be more politically explicit, as it were, as a, as a campaigner? My plays have always dealt with um, political matters, really. Um, you say obliquely, well, perhaps, but they always dealt with power mm -hmm. and, and uh, the powerful and the powerless. Um, but the longer I live, the more I feel that I have an obligation to um, be very, very precise and concrete about the way power is manifested and, um, in this world and the way hypocrisy is um, manifested, really. So I think it's um, an obligation on me as a citizen to be very, very clear about what I actually think. I think, by the way, I'm, that it's an obligation on everybody. Mm -hmm. You just had a particular platform, but it, you must be the first Nobel laureate to have offered your services as a speechwriter to the American president. Yes. I do think the American president and, um, and our prime minister, prime minister of this country, um, are gangsters. Your views on America are very precise, in as much as there is no, there is no light and shade there. America to you is just a kind of personification of the evil empire. That's not quite true. In fact, it's by no means true. Let me, allow me to correct that. I'm actually talking about uh, principally the American government, clearly, um, the administration, and also, of course, um, many, many uh, millions of people in America who are as ignorant as the American administration is and support the American administration. But there's a growing opposition to what is happening. And the Americans, I, I get a, quite a lot of information from the United States, and the Americans are using a term that I've always been very, very uh, hesitant about using myself, because it's too easily used, perhaps. But they are using it, and they're calling it fascism. Mm -hmm. They're calling their own government a fascist government. And they are desperate. So, as I say, there are many Americans. Politics um, has been this strong undertow, this strong uh, undercurrent for most of your life since your, perhaps your first political act uh, in 1948, which was to be a conscientious yes. objector. And, and in a sense, for, that set you apart. Oh yes, it was a very, um, it was actually very uh, difficult for my family to cope with the fact that their Jewish son um, was prepared to go to prison rather than join the army. This was, I remind, after the war, 1948. And I could see, I was 18, and I could see that the, um, the Cold War was beginning and I realized that um, it was a very perilous time and I simply refused to uh, subscribe to it. I didn't, in fact, go to prison. I, I had a very civilized magistrate, twice, mm -hmm. who um, fined my father because I had no money, and nor had he. Had you been older, had you been called up during the war, would you have fought? Yes, I certainly would. I was 15 when the war ended, um, in 1945, and, but I, if I had been 18, uh, I would certainly have um, felt a, an obligation to um, join, join the army, yeah. But isn't there a contradiction here? I mean, that you would have fought 
against fascism, but you felt no need to fight against what eventually was a very corrosive um, ideology for the Eastern European states, which was communism. Well, fascism um, was evidently, and, and by 1948 we knew all about what had happened in, um, in Europe. Mm -hmm. We knew about the camps and the horror of it all. Um, but at the time, even earlier, uh, it was evident that, um, that Hitler was a monster. And um, that this war was as it were, inevitable, otherwise civilization would really go down the drain. We've been talking about the use of language when it comes to politics. Uh, but you said so often below the spoken word is a thing known and unspoken. Has that been your guide? I think that, um, yes that we often, we so often use language to disguise what we actually, um, what our actions are. So language indeed is, has become, I do believe, um, corrupt. Language is a weapon of menace. We do use language as, as uh, weapons also, but we use language, politicians use language like terms, like terminology, like, um, as you well know, freedom and democracy and liberty, when they actually mean death and destruction. We are going to kill you for your own good. As well as conveying the sense of violence and this unease, and, and it's a kind of destabilizing uh, force language in your plays, yet in the most everyday settings. And I wonder if you think there is menace in people's everyday relationships. Well, sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. <laughs> um, as we all know, there's a great, great, great deal of violence in this society. Um, and, in, and certainly in, in many, many family relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've written, I have written plays about, like The Homecoming, which contains very violent uh, hostilities and antagonisms. Um, and a kind of Philistine force, you know. I tell you what I actually think. Do you want to know what I actually think? I really want to know what you actually think. <laughs> I actually think that life is beautiful, that the world is hell. Mm -hmm. I think the world is, as it were, hell on earth, if you like. But the actual, the bloom of life itself um, is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful poem by Milos, you know, which talks of, of, of children, actually. Um, how is it that children born, I can't remember it exactly, you know, with teddy bears and so on, having a, just finding life rather, they cry and they don't, and they, et cetera, et cetera, they don't, they don't find it all terribly comfortable. But they nevertheless are, extraordinarily interested in things and, and as it were optimistic and how is it that those children Milos asks become monsters when they are grown up and that's a terrible question and it's a question that there's no there's simply no answer to really. but that that um, as it were statement that life is beautiful is not something that would emanate obviously, from your plays. I believe it to be the case myself in my life. Mind you, it doesn't mean that life isn't extremely difficult and always has been. But I believe, nevertheless, there is a, um, a unique, 